while we gather together as persons, and at the center of our gathering are symbols, and one of those symbols is the open Bible, which we see here laid out before the Christ light. And that picks up the idea that in scriptures we find guidance to help us find and secure our way in this world. I'd like to just begin with a brief word about the Matthew text about the question of authority. And in that context, Jesus is going about being who he is, doing what he does, and raising all kinds of curiosity. He is especially curious for those folks, folks who are not doing so well, because he seems to be proposing to them that God is going to change things and make it better for everyone. But there are others who notice Jesus going about, and they have legal questions about him. And that basic question is, by what authority are you doing these things? And rather than get into a great conversation about the nature of authority, I would like to simply say that when we look at Jesus making such a statement, we might do well to take away from it the message that in a very basic and simple way, to be kind requires no other authority. That is to say, you don't have to be kind because the minister tells you to be kind. You don't have to be kind because the government tells you to be kind. You don't have to be kind because of any external constraint. Kindness is a very natural part of who you are as a human being. All you need to do is to allow it to rise up and take its place in your experience. And so to be kind people requires no external authority. And I'll just leave it with that. Trust the kindness that is in you. Respond to it. Follow it. It will never lead you wrong. It might lead you into hard places sometimes, but it will never lead you wrong. Now thinking about this text and thinking about the theme as one who serves, I began to go through my memory of uh, experience in the world, as we all have it, and I tried to think of some example of what it is that I would like to leave in your understanding. And I came up with my experience in Kamloops, BC. Uh, we moved there so that Barbara could become the Dean of Nursing at the University, Thompson Rivers University. And I arrived there and I really had no work to do. So I set about just trying to get connected with the community to find groups and individuals who are doing something to try to make a difference for the well-being of the people of that city and the broader context. And I ended up at a United Church that did not get employed there, I became a volunteer. And I worked with a group of women who called themselves the Sensational Soup Group. And we were 12 women and one skinny man, and every Tuesday and every Thursday, we made two pots of soup. Generally, one would be vegetarian and one would have meat in it. But these ladies, and I was privileged to participate with them because I learned so much from them, they were all different in terms of their faith perspectives. Some of them had dropped out of religious experience altogether and had simply become human beings doing the best that they could. We had three ladies who belonged to a sect from in India, and I can't remember the name of their guru, but they were just lovely, kind, hard-working ladies who wanted to participate. We had one lady, and she was actually the leader, and she uh, belonged to a, a practice called shamanism. And some of you may know that shamanism is an ancient and primitive form of, well, I don't know how to speak of it exactly, but what it is, you try to use mystical, divine, spiritual resources to make a difference in the world. And so this lady was one of the key inspirers of our project. But what we did is we get together very early in the morning and we begin chopping onions, peeling carrots, peeling potatoes, there was just this whole sense of a community of persons at work with the things of nature, and most of them received either from the food bank or from volunteers in the community, uh, donors. And we would start to cook this soup, and that soup would end up having a delightful aroma. And I began to think of that aroma as a symbol, because what was happening in the kitchen, and you know how it is with something that smells good in the oven or on the stove, it creeps into the whole house. 
And when folks walk in the door, they say, hmm, what's that? But what we did in that kitchen, our culture, and who we were as persons together, and basically who we were as spiritual persons, filled the place with a sense of happiness. Most of our work was characterized by storytelling and laughter. Occasionally there would be sad times, there would have been a tragedy in somebody's life or a misfortune. Maybe somebody's son or daughter was in a situation that was not comfortable for them. And then we would sort of sympathize and be in solidarity with one another. So that we truly enacted um, part of our United Church Creed. We are not alone, thanks be to God. And I want to emphasize how beneficial it was for me as a participant in this project and how beneficial it was for these women to participate in this project. But something else happened which was quite extraordinary. When we first began, we had about 20 or 30 people coming for soup. By the time I left Kamloops, we were having about 150 persons coming for soup. And we had a reputation in town that not only was it some of the best free soup you could get anywhere, but there was no sense of stigma or shame. They felt welcomed and accepted. And my theory about that was that the health of the volunteers, the spiritual well-being, the love that was in them, which I'll characterize as the smile or the radiant faces that they displayed, had an influence on the persons who came for dinner. And one of the things we were clear on is what we call soft boundaries. Sometimes in charity work we have what we call a hard boundary where the people who provide the goods and the people who receive the goods are separated. But we wanted it to be an intermixed community that we wanted to be close with them, so we served them at their tables. And I in particular was one of the servers. And doing that service, I got a chance just to look people in the face, get a measure of how they were doing, speak an encouraging word, speak a supportive word, sometimes maybe be asked a question about resources and stuff. All to say that this healthy group of women doing a simple task, preparing soup for others, generated a community which was healthy for all those who came in the door. And so we began to experience people having a newer outlook on life. One case stands out in a great detail for me. This was a man who was deeply schizophrenic. He would come in there all bundled up in his pocket, all scruffy, never really talked, mumbled to himself, just sat there. At the end of about a year with us, he was talking, he was interacting with people. He was beginning to feel that he had a place to belong. And I want to emphasize that story because whatever small project you get involved with, as a member of this faith community, it offers you an opportunity to grow, and it offers you an opportunity to make a difference in the lives of those who will be attracted to the service that you provide. And there are many ways in which this congregation is exemplary in this already. I don't really need to encourage you to get engaged because many of you already are engaged, and I can thank you for that. And to say to you that that engagement is a key part in how it is that God is going to change the world and make it a better place for all persons. We, as we lift up our hearts and our hands to find God's way, become agents of change. And it's not extraordinary. It's not doing miracles in a big sense. It's doing ordinary things in a small way with great love. So even coming to church on Sunday morning, to prepare yourself and to come in through the door saying, today I want to radiate blessing. I want goodness to be communicated by my being in the room. And that means the creation of a culture which becomes a healing place. Now all of this is directly connected to the text from Philippians, which speaks about Jesus who is called the Christ by the later church, who I prefer to know as Jesus of Nazareth, the plain person who did the good. We jump too quickly sometimes to the almighty God part of Jesus' gospel, and we forget the plain, ordinary humanity of his life, that he made a difference, not by making himself great, but by making himself small. That is to say, there was nobody that Jesus met who he considered to be beneath him, 
So there were persons in that context, if a leper would walk by, they would do everything in their power to avoid the leper. If a poor person walked by, they would do everything in their power not to notice. They took care of poor people by giving alms at the temple, but they didn't want any direct contact with the poor people. Prostitutes, thieves, all those folks who we call the dropouts or the losers or the failures in our society, Jesus never looked down on them. He always interacted with them and offered them an opportunity for change. And we know all of the stories of those persons who met Jesus and by the spirit that was in him, by that warm, accepting presence that he displayed, their lives were changed through their faith in him. So we see lame people walking away, we see blind people seeing things, we see dead people raised. And however we understand that, we must accept that Jesus, by making himself a servant to the least, made a difference. So what I would like to encourage you, and which I have pulled as my own guide in life, is to cultivate a serving heart. And I'm going to suggest that there's a place where you might find the example. And I'm going to draw on one text which wasn't read today, but it's just prior to going to the crucifixion, when Jesus is gathered with his friends, and he gives a small talk about the nature of power in the world. And he speaks about those in high places always sit down and they get served their suppers and their lunches and their breakfasts. And then Jesus makes the case that he is not with us, he's not with those people, but not with us either, as somebody high and mighty. He's not somebody who wants to be taken care of. Jesus is somebody who takes care of. And I'd like to make it as plain as I can that all of my study over the years has not yet disproven this. But when Jesus says, I am among you as one who serves, he can only be referring to a specific group of people. Because he's in first century Palestine, he's among the poorest people, so he cannot be talking about servants in a rich person's house. He's not that kind of servant. The only kind of servant we can imagine is Jesus saying, you know how your mom is? That's how I am. You know how your grandma is? That's how I am. You know how your auntie is? That's how I am. And each one of us in our lived experience can remember back and almost universally, up until a certain point, men sat at a table when they came home from work and they were served their supper and then they went to sit and watch TV and mom or sisters would clean up the dishes. So in other words, throughout all of history, God's presence has been manifest through the ordinary work of women, caring for their families, caring for their households, caring for their neighborhoods. So if you're looking for an example of what it means, find somebody around you who just knows how to get engaged, who knows how to make a difference, and ask, could you, could I come with you one time when you go to the food bank? Or can I come with you one time when you go to the soup kitchen? Or can I come with you when you're doing this project that you're going to do? And I assure you, as you begin to move into that giving of yourself to others attitude, the riches that you've been longing for, the true riches, the spiritual riches, joy and peace and all those other good gifts will become your possession. So I encourage you to, wherever you can, make the small difference you can by being a positive, radiant presence of God's love in your experience. I'm going to ask you to sing a song, and it's called Master, Let Me Walk With Thee, to pick up the idea that what Jesus, how Jesus lived, that's how we like to live. Five, six,